All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a nice break, got some food. Uh, I had some food and I had my coffee next to me <laughs> for the second half. And uh, we have three more great sessions ahead in the second half. And they're starting off with Soren, who will tell us more about molecule testing. I think it was already mentioned a little bit earlier on, but uh, he will give more information, um, tips, and some um, extra tips and tricks probably. So Soren, please. Uh, sorry, I will share the video that has been pre-recorded, and he'll be available to answer questions as the video is playing, as well as after the presentation. Okay, so what is Molecule? Molecule is the missing testing frameworks for Ansible playbooks and roles. Um, and um, mainly I am the current maintainer of, uh, of the framework. It wasn't created by me, but about one and a half years ago, I, uh, I discovered it and uh, it was like a godsend solution for um, our team. I'm part of the OpenStack Triple O team. So mainly we deploy hundreds of OpenStack clouds per day as part of the CI. And uh, most of our code is now Ansible. Uh, and we needed to test it. And uh, historically we tested by doing full integrations. But doing full integrations means that it takes a lot of time, at least two to three hours uh, for the simple ones. Um, and we needed a way to do more something at a lower level, like a functional testing, like testing single roles in isolation, single playbooks in isolation. Because if we touch only one piece of code, we wanted to test it with different scenarios, but without the big picture, because we wanted to get results like in few minutes, not in hours. Um, so I will try to explain a little bit about how Molecule works. Um, okay, let me see. Okay. Um, so first I sh probably I already covered this. Uh, why we need to test code because code gets rotten and even a minor change can have undesired side effects much later. Um, and also, before, doing manual testing doesn't pay well. Good jobs are when you put computers to do the, the, the boring stuff for you. So, uh, before going into the tool itself, I will try to explain a uh, few terms uh, that are used a lot. What is a driver or provider? Mainly it's a backend that is used to provide the hosts that are used for testing. Because Molecule itself yeah, um, does the provisioning and destroying of the test resources because you do not want to run stuff on your local host, right? You have stuff that may wipe machines, install new services, reconfigure them and so on. You want to have them in isolation. The scenario basically is a test. Um, and if you are uh, coming from uh, a development background, it's like a test in PyTest. Um, a, um, a scenario is made out of various commands that are run by molecule. I'll, um, these commands, a group of commands make a, a sequence. Um, and you can just invoke sequences instead of having to run like two, three, five, even 10 steps one after, uh, one after another. Uh, a verifier is the step that is used to validate that what you executed produced the desired effects. So you can use molecule 
to test roles, playbooks, or anything else because it does run Ansible in the end. So effectively, what it executes, it executes a Ansible, which means that you can run a shell task that does anything else that you may, may want. Um, one thing that uh, you should be aware of that by default, the tool itself was created as a, as a common line tool for development purposes, which means that it does not orchestrate by itself execution of multiple scenarios. But there are other extensions like PyTest Molecule that does this for you. So you can mainly PyTest Molecule, it's a plugin for PyTest that makes PyTest believe that each molecule scenario from inside your code repository, it's a PyTest. So if you are already using PyTest, you can just plug it in and, and test the Ansible code with it. And also it doesn't make coffee. So to install molecule, you just use pip. It's the easiest way. There are other um, possible ways like running it from a, a published Docker container. Uh, by default, uh, it comes with some plugins. Uh, uh, in the example that you can see here, I'm also installing the optional Azure plugin and the Docker one. The Docker one is part of the core. So this is why you see as the, the uh, Python extras Docker, because if you just do a pip install molecule, it will not install the Docker dependencies for it. Um, and if you want to, to, uh, to see what drivers you have installed, you just run molecule drivers and it will list all the drivers that are installed. As you can see in the example below, you have Azure because you install it as an optional. And the other ones are always installed because they are currently part of the core, delegated, Docker and Podman. Um, the, the, the common line uh, is quite easy to, to use, you uh, with minus help, you can get some uh, uh, useful information. And as you can see, you have simple commands like check, clean up, converge, create dependency. I will explain later what they do. Um, so about molecule drivers, these are probably the most important part because this is what you use in order to, um, to test your roles and your, your playbooks. Um, th there is one special driver, which is called delegated. Delegated means that I already have an inventory and you are going to use this inventory. So molecule itself will not provision anything for you, will trust the stuff that you have. This is common, for example, if you use um, uh, continuous integration where you create you allocate the nodes before the job starts. For example, we use Zool and Zool creates the testing nodes for us um, on OpenStack. And in this case, we, we may use the delegated in order to, because it's externalized, let's say, the allocation. Um, the most common driver with Molecule is the Docker one. It's the most popular one because it's the easiest one and uh, to use on most platforms. You can use on Mac OS, Linux, and so on, and it does give you the level of isolation that you want uh, in order not to mess with your machine, right? Um, also, you, you can use the Podman uh, driver, which is almost identical with the Docker one. So you can use Podman. Uh, also, oh, there are the cloud plugins like Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, OpenStack, Vagrant, LXD, Libvirt, which is not fully ready yet, but there is work on it. Um, and it's very easy to switch from one to another. It's like just changing the YAML file, two lines in the YAML file, to switch from one driver to another. Um, but keep, uh, you need to keep in mind that the driver is used by the create and destroy part, because create is allocating, is creating the inventory, and destroy is deallocating it. So uh, 
Yes, I think I already explained that you should use containers when you can use them. If your playbook can uh, is performing tasks that can run inside the container, you should use a container. But if you start to use stuff like system D, you may start getting into troubles, right? If you, for example, if you have a playbook or a role that is installing Docker, probably you do not want to use a container to, to test that you are installing Docker. You want to use a real VM, and in this case, you use one of the other um, drivers. But if you deploy just a simple service or install some, some stuff, use containers because they, are, they have the lowest footprint. Um, molecule verifiers. Molecule comes with three verifiers. Uh, the default one is now Ansible. It used to be Testinfra, which is um, a PyTest plugin for uh, validating that uh, uh, different changes were made on, on a computer. It's a very useful one, but I do not recommend it if your team is not used to Python or testing for itself, because it's, let's say, it's more powerful than using Ansible. You can do much more innovative stuff or checks, or, but it's harder. If, you, if, you, if your team is more used to Ansible, it's easier to use Ansible to test Ansible, right? Because you can run few tasks to validate that the service is still running, right? After you, you run your code and, and stuff like this, or that a file was created or a file was removed and stuff like this. GOS is another um, uh, plugin, uh, which I cannot tell too much about it. Um, so what are molecule commands? So when you are inside, let's say you are inside the role and you want to, um, to test stuff, you can just do molecule test. And by default, it will run the, the entire test sequence uh, for, for that role. If you go to another role, you can run the same uh, in another role. It will run um, the default scenario for that role. Uh, but, for example, sometimes you don't want to run the entire uh, test sequence and you want to run only create or converge again because you discovered that you made, made a mistake in the testing playbook. And um, you can just run converge and to run just converge again. So you don't need to recreate the machine uh, do the check-in and so on. Um, so it's very easy to in, um, for development. In CI, obviously, that you just run test because you want to have the full, uh, full test. Um, and to get an idea about what test does in a more, uh, let's say, in the most complex scenario, it has about 10 steps which are, these are the default ones, but you can customize them if you want. So you can remove some of them. And most of them are optional. It means that if you do not have a playbook with this name, uh, uh, Molecule will just skip it. Dependency, for example, is installing dependencies like other roles from Galaxy, for example. Linting is running the, the linters. Uh, cleanup is doing some extra preparation. Uh, for, a, for a machine and destroy, as you can see, it's like just to be sure that if you run test uh, twice and it, the first time it fails during converge, you start from the, the same machine when you run test again. So mainly you want to destroy if a machine already existed and recreate it, right? Because otherwise you may have different results when you run the second time. Converge is the most important part um, on it because this is where you run effectively the tested code. The tempo test is running the same again and raising errors if you have changed task. Mainly is testing the impotence of your role or playbook because as you probably know, if you run it twice, it shouldn't change anything because the system should be already at the desired state. You already, uh, obviously in some cases, this doesn't make sense, which means that it's an optional step. Verify, verify it's a playbook where you can put extra tests 
that uh, that are validating that you did end up with the desired system state. Um, clean up and destroy, I already mentioned. Um, so, at any point in time, you can check the current state of uh, of your inventory. Doing a molecule list will will list a list of instances because molecule itself takes care of managing the in, the testing inventory for you, and you can see what driver the instance is using, what provisioner. What is uh, what is the scenario if it was created or not? For example, if I run create it, a uh, molecule create when create it will create, and the result will be that it's created. Converge it means did I run converge on it or not yet? So after creation, obviously the converge will be false. But after I run converge, this will become true. This is quite important when you do stuff like tempo test testing and so on. Uh, by default, running molecule tests will destroy the mach ma machines um, uh, at the end. But if you want to step to look inside and so on, you may disable these functionalities. This is in order to, you can even uh, define if you want an environment variable to disable these functionalities. This is good, a good protection for not having a lot of uh, leftovers. Uh, from your from your testing, like stone machine that runs because if you use a cloud, you'll end up having to pay for a machine that you forget to to stop. Um, so, um, I will uh, show you here the, the default uh, um, layout of a molecule scenario inside the role. Probably you already see that. You have the tasks, variables. Most of this is a normal role. The only thing that is new here is that you see a molecule folder. Molecule folder is like a test folder where you put the tests. There is a subdirectory here, which is uh, in this example called default. This is the default scenario. This is when you do not specify a scenario name from the command line with molecule, it will use the default one. But you can create as many as you want, and you can run them because you you can have multiple testing scenarios for your roles. And inside you have mainly most of these are Ansible playbooks, which are run for uh, respective um, steps. The only one that is not a, a playbook is Molecule YAML. This is the definition of the scenario, the configuration, and you'll see an example later. But um, keep in mind the only thing that is molecule specific in this is the molecule folder. The other stuff is just a role. Um, so about molecule config, uh, this is a new feature that was introduced recently, I think in the last two months, uh, which allows you to avoid um, repeating yourself in your molecule YAML file. So you can create a config file which is inherited by the molecule YAML file. Uh, maybe it's not very important now to go into, into details about it, but just keep in mind that if you end up seeing a lot of boilerplate copied from one molecule YAML file to another, there is a solution for allowing you to avoiding it, avoiding the repetition. This is a, a, a molecule YAML file and an example, um, maybe you just have to specify the driver that is going to be used and the commands that you want to run. More stuff, all the other stuff are optional. Um, okay. Okay, uh, I think that's all for the moment. Um, Uh, I don't know what, let me see what questions do I have here. Ah, if molecule can be used for network infrastructure, uh, yes, you can use it. In fact, you can even use molecule to provision your own stuff if you want. 
if there is a separate local driver for molecule. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, this, but I think this is most related to delegated. So you can see delegated that it's something like this. Um, okay. Um, Ah, free node. And for uh, molecule itself, there is an uh, Ansible molecule channel. Now I realize that um, I didn't update this. There is an Ansible molecule for um, for molecule. Obviously, if you if you ask stuff about molecule on uh, Ansible Galaxy, you'll get answers about it. No, um, and probably I will uh, I will ping you. Um, yes, this is a mistake here because it should be Ansible dash molecule. Um, it's quite an active uh, active channel. Um, I think that earlier this year, the uh, molecule itself was split into plugins. So now, we, um, based on what provider you are using, you may have to go to different codes repository if you if you have bugs. It used to be monolithical with 11 providers, and it was a nightmare to make any change because it was impossible to test with 11 clouds. Um, and this is why we split it into plugins. Most of them are out, only Docker and Podman are kept in for convenience. The plan uh, is to move them also out in order to e uh, make it easier to develop the core on it. Um, and uh, I don't know if anyone has other questions, I'll be more than happy to, to answer. All right, thank you for that great presentation. And already I see there were some questions in Q&A and in chat that has been answered. If there are more, please feel free to Ask Soren right here. Busy replying to some of you as well. Yeah, we will share the um, the Q and A logs, uh, the attendees, so you have a copy of that as well. And uh, chat logs, probably we can do that. Filter out the inform in in important information there as well and there's also a poll um that's put up about molecule if you could answer that so we have an idea of how many of you have heard of molecule before this probably it would be a good idea to ask questions directly in, into discussions right um i think it would be much easier because we have almost 80 questions now, right? That's it's true. It's hard yeah. to find the ones that I can answer. That's true. It's it's actually, now that the chat is not too busy, it's actually a good, better place to ask the questions. And Soren has been uh, actively responding as well. Yes, Gondolo has put the uh, links to the GitHub repo and discussion where you can discuss more about Molecule right there. And now there's a new poll after you've listened to the presentation. How do you feel about it? Please respond. If you've missed most of the lecture, uh, the recordings will be made available and shared after the event. So um, unfortunately, you can't vote based on the response, but um, you can definitely see the videos again afterwards. All right, thank you very much, Soren and everyone. And please keep uh, chatting on, on the, the chat and the Q&A channels. We are now, uh, it's time for the next session, which is actually my session. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how you can contribute in different ways, uh, especially 
for those who doesn't feel as confident about coding or contributing in a technical way right from the start, there's definitely other ways to do so. So I'm going to share this video, which I talk where I talk about outreach and news. Hello, um, welcome to my session on how to contribute to Ansible community via meetups, outreach, and the bullhorn. My name is Carol Chen, and I invite you to follow along with uh, on this web page, github.com slash ansible slash community slash wiki. Uh, before I start, I will uh, do a little bit of introduction. Um, you might already know who I am because I've been hosting this uh, Contributor Summit. But in case you are seeing this video for the first time, I am Carol Chen, as mentioned. Uh, I work in the Ansible community team at Red Hat. And uh, previously, I've been a software engineer at Nokia for a while. And then I branched out to interacting more with developers in the community when I joined a startup called Yola here in Finland. And shortly after that, I joined Red Hat and uh, have been doing community management for different projects, starting with Manage IQ, Koku, and currently with the Ansible community for about two years. Uh, I've traveled quite a bit thanks to my job, and um, I've been to four, more than 40 countries. Um, not recently, I haven't <laughs> traveled anywhere since uh, end of February this year. But um, it's been quite an, a challenge and exciting thing to do a lot of things online and reaching actually a broader audience that way. In my spare time, I, I like to hit instruments in the orchestra. And um, you can contact me with some of these um, different uh, chat social channels and chat, uh, IRC, uh, Mat Matrix, Twitter, and so on. All right, let's go back to this wiki that I was mentioning. So um, if you heard the uh, presentation by Gondolo, John Barker, uh, earlier today, he mentioned about uh, the, the different working groups in Ansible community. So this is the, um, the, 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 the homepage for uh, collecting all these different working groups. And uh, the two I want to touch on specifically are uh, outreach and news. So outreach is about, um, you know, getting uh, events and meetups uh, and connecting with the community, uh, usually with events. And um, so, you know, there's diff different ways, as we talked about, of contribution, not necessarily code, but also documentation, testing. And um, outreach is definitely one, uh, very important and, and um, um, very appreciated way of doing that. So uh, we have a lot of meetup groups, which I'll uh, go into more details in it shortly. And then also uh, we have events around the world, um, nowadays mostly online. And um, so there are many ways that you can um, participate in the outreach part. And then news, which uh, means like um, currently the main thing is the newsletter, the bullhorn, which is a news Ansible newsletter for the developer community. And um, we hope to expand that as well. So outreach, meetups. Let's take a look at the outreach wiki. If you click on the outreach working group, you get a bit of information about how to get started. Um, and if you go to meetup, uh, esbo.meetup.com, you get a list. Well, first you get to this page, which shows you overview of all the different meetup groups on meetup.com that has Ansible as their keyword. And we have 267, so almost 300 groups that um, relates to Ansible, and um, many of them are very active, and we're very proud of that. Uh, if you click on show all here, and you can see all the different individual groups listed. For example, I'm based in Finland, so I do a search, Finland. Currently, there's one Ansible Helsinki group 
I'm actually uh, living in Tampere, Finland, which is 180 kilometers north of Helsinki. But I do go attend um, meetups there when I was able to. Um, but you can also, uh, if there's enough interest in your city or area, you can also uh, get started, uh, start a, your own meetup group, local meetup group there. So feel free to contact us, and there's information on how to do that if you go to the outreach working group and click on how to start a meetup, look here, and then you get the information on how to get started. So for meetups, there's not just, there's many ways to participate. The very easy way is find a meetup in your area or online nowadays and attend it. Uh, this is a, the most, um, straightforward way of participation. Join a meetup, part with people in the community, uh, learn something, share something. Sharing is the next step. If you have a topic um, you are you know, more knowledgeable about or interested about, you can give a presentation at the meetup uh, and share um, your experiences. So sometimes it's not just about um, how good everything is, but also sometimes if you um, find out some problems or uh, some some something you tried and it didn't work out the way you wanted and you know, that's definitely a lesson learned. You can also share that. So present presenting at meetups is another way of uh, participating and contributing. And of of course we have a lot of um, people who do even more. They they take the initiative to start a meetup group or uh, join an existing meetup group and help to organize these meetups. Uh, it does take a bit more effort, and we that's why we really appreciate our organizers, because you have to um, find speakers, uh, find a location, which nowadays means um, as by finding an online uh, meetup um, event platform to use rather than physical space. But as we, you know, hopefully get back to face-to-face um, -face meetups, um, that will be something that people usually spend time on to find the locations, get some refreshments for the attendees, and so on. So um, we have about 130, 140 uh, meetups that um, we sponsor, which means we pay the um, meetup.com subscription fees, and we have a kind of a close working relationship with those organizers. So um, th thanks to all these uh, already um, people who are already organizing the, these meetups around the world and online. And also, if you're interested, um, please feel free to get in touch with us. So yeah, so we have this um, map of the different meetup groups we have around the world. You can see this, you know, in the US, there's meetups on the both coasts as well as around uh, across the country. The size of the blue circles indicates the approximate um, meetup membership. And also in Europe, we have quite a few large meetups as well. And in India, in APAC, South America, and so on. So, um, of course, some are large in terms of membership numbers, partly because they are, you know, large metropolitan areas like Pune in India or London, Paris, and um, probably New York, and so on. Um, but because we also look at people who attend the meetups, uh, the RSVP numbers. And sometimes we have actually quite high RSVP numbers from some of the smaller meetups. Um, so, you know, we also encourage people not just getting a large meetup group set up, but also encourage people to, to fill it with interesting content and interactions so you get your members to participate more actively. And um, that helps to grow the community. Um, again, if you need references or um, help to get uh, speakers, uh, we probably can help, but usually, you know, it's your connections. If you know someone or you yourself have a topic, feel free to um, step forward and, and present at a meetup. 
So yeah, we have also this page, uh, Organize an ESBO Meetup, which is linked from the Outreach Wiki page here. And yeah, so there's this playbook to organizing. Um, check the list of ESBO Meetups on meetup.com. Um, if there is a one in your area, feel free to contact us and um, try to set one up. And of course, um, there's different ways to support the meetup, like I said. Uh, if you're experienced, you can give a talk. If, if not, you know, just attending and chatting and asking questions, uh, that's always uh, very good to uh, encourage the, the interaction and en engagement of the community. And if you're a business, it will really help if you can sponsor. Um, in, in a physical meetup, of course, the, the, the space, a venue, as well as some refreshments. But even in a virtual setup, we have sponsors who sponsor their meeting platform, for example, and uh, um, resources like that. So there's many ways you can contribute with events and meetups. So now let me go to, from these uh, working groups, go to the news wiki page. It brings you here. It's relatively new group and um, we started the first issue um, in April of this year. So this is the bullhorn, which is the newsletter for ENSCO developer community. And this is another way that you can uh, help and contribute to the uh, community, to Ansible. So if you go to this contribute suggest content here, it will bring you to this GitHub issue that um, we use to publicly work with the community and to collect um, content for upcoming newsletters. So the most latest one is issue 11 that has been published uh, two weeks ago. The next one, we try to do one every two weeks, but because this week is um, pretty special, it is Ansible Fest and Ansible Con Contributor Summit. So we are publishing issue 12 next week on um, October 21st. So you can see usually we have a two or three week cadence depending and then um, we try to have the content all in by the Friday the week before and so we have time to edit and review before publishing. And uh, right now I'm doing most of this uh, coordinating but we have a lot of great contributions from the community in terms of like articles or uh, announcing like new releases for collections. Uh, they remind me of that so I can include it in the newsletter or surveys and uh, uh, articles that the uh, community has written and things like that. Um, but if you are willing to help even further, I could always use people who help with the editing. Uh, I'm not, you know, the best uh, writer or um, somebody who, you know, it's always good to have an extra pair of eyes to check the content and check for spelling mistakes and typos and things like that. Um, so again, if you're interested, reach out to us uh, or just comment on this GitHub issue and we'll be um, really happy to have you on board. So yeah, that's um, all different ways you can contribute in in terms of oops in terms of um, outreach and newsletter. But of course, um, we always welcome different suggestions and ideas. So uh, feel free to reach out. And um, information is you can get most of this linked from github.com slash ansible slash community slash wiki. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I will set up a poll about how you have been engaged and active and 
if you are interested to find out more. Um, please feel free to ask any questions you have, and uh, I will talk to you after this. Take care. Hi, Carol. I think you're muted. We can't hear you at all. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why it says audio on, but then, yeah. So <laughs> let me go back to, yeah, I, I was just saying uh, there's a poll going on right now about meetups, and I see um, many of you have not uh, participated in meetups and would like to, so, so I hope that was useful, and um, I forgot to mention one thing is that we do have goodies and swag, and we try to, some, some organizers contact us and uh, we try to send some stickers or small items that especially for presenters and organizers, we want to show our appreciation, so we are able to do that. Although this year it has been, the situation has been a bit uh, challenging. Shipments are taking very, very long, and sometimes um, some locations are not even, when we are not able to ship to all locations. But um, do contact me if you need, and uh, if you have meetups going on virtual or in person, and uh, we will try to um, get some things to you if possible. At the very least, stickers, hopefully, you know. Um, well, it, <laughs> Again, it, it, it's probably easier for in-person meetups. I don't know how many of those are going on right now, if it's possible. I think some, some places they can you know, have people, if it's not under 20 or 30 persons, they can have a gathering with social distancing. So if that's possible. If not, um, that there are ways we can send stuff also to presenters. But um, yeah, contact me and, and we can figure something out. <laughs> or the comments of, about me being muted, yeah. All right, um, is there any more questions? Can we get some? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a bit difficult right now. If, if at a virtual meetup, how, how do you send everyone a piece of sticker, right? So um, it. It is possible if you go to the cool, uh, Red Hat Cool Stuff store, there are, I believe, Ansible stickers for sale. They are not, I mean, they are relatively inexpensive. Let me see if I can find the Cool Stuff store link. If you search for Ansible. I shared the link in chat. Um, it's you can um, get some Red Hat and Inspo goodies over there, swag. Again, I'm not sure if they ship everywhere. I think some countries in Asia and maybe South America, it's a bit challenging. But most of most European and North America countries be fine. In absence of face-to-face -face meetings, can we get used to cool background images? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Soren, you had a nice green background. I thought you were gonna put some like you know cool images with the green. <laughs> and also the bullhorn um, if you have not subscribed please feel free to do so um, I think Gandalo shared the link a bit earlier and um, I think the wiki is probably one of the best places because most of the links are there if you go to to the news working group you get all the bullhorn links if you go to the meetup uh, the, the outreach group you get all the meetup 
uh, information and links, and also all, all the other working groups as well. So if, if there's one thing you, you bookmark, I think that will be um, highly recommended. I put the wiki link in the chat as well. Mm. There, there is some limitations of the Blue Jeans app with green, uh, green screen. There's one question in Q&A about the um, role for Galaxy installation, oh, sorry, AWX installation. I know of one written by Jeff Gearling, but I'm not sure if it installs the latest AWX version. Would Jeff or somebody be able to answer that? Uh, typically, for AWX, I'm now using the official installer. I, it, AWX ships with its own installers for Docker, using Docker Compose, or for OpenShift or Kubernetes. And uh, there's there's a few different ways to install it. But um, I haven't really been updating that role since the installer was made to work in so many different ways, just because that role only did one specific thing, and it only worked with older versions of AWX. And now uh, it's time for another short break. And uh, please come back uh, after, I think, about 20 minutes. And uh, we'll have the final session uh, by Greg Sutcliffe, and it's a really cool one, so don't miss it. <laughs> 